This is Dan, and this is the Napkin Academy. Today, what we'll be covering is something I call the four story lines. The simple idea is this. I really do believe that it is story that really seems to make life matter to us. That's a big statement. I want to tell you exactly what I mean. I had a chance yesterday to go and see this new movie, Gravity. And I'm a space fanatic since the time I was a little kid, so of course I was drawn to the movie. But whether you enjoy space stories or not, I cannot strongly enough encourage you to go see this movie, Gravity. It is the most magnificent visual experience I've had in a long time. So I've been following uh, people, following the movie on Twitter, and I found an interesting thought. There are a number of experts around the world, people who really know astronomy and spaceflight very, very well, who are chiming in regarding the movie. Uniformly, everybody loves the movie, but I thought it's interesting because a couple of these experts, something you get the sense is bothering them about the success of the movie. So Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, who is probably America's most famous astronomer right now, he's head of the uh, Rose uh, Astronomy Center at the Na American Museum of Natural History in New York, also a prolific author of all things related to space and science, and a woman named uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, who is actually a European Space Agency astronaut, an Italian uh, Air Force officer, and will be flying up to the International Space Station in December of 2014. So these are two people who absolutely know their stuff. And there's something that's concerning to them about the movie, and I think the best way to summarize their concern is this. These experts are asking, why are audiences paying so much more attention to fiction in the form of this movie than they are to the facts, which are that we actually have this hardware and these people in space, and they're up there every day, and yet very few people actually pay attention. And here, let's just look at it. Let's break it down. So the facts are, up until recently, we did have space shuttles flying in orbit. Every day for the last 15 years, we've had astronauts in orbit, and they've been aboard the International Space Station. Those are all facts. This is something that every night you can go outside and look up and see the, the space station flying overhead, knowing that there are live human beings working on it. And yet over those 15 years, interest has really waned, interest in uh, space agencies around the world. It's, it's very difficult to keep people's interest. So here's fiction as represented in the movie Gravity. It's exactly the same space shuttle. It is exactly the same International Space Station. And it is exactly the same astronauts, except for the fact that they're now played by Hollywood stars, which I don't think is really the critical issue. But interest is through the roof biggest opening weekend of a movie in October uh, ever. $55 million in three days, and it's going to probably now uh, receive several Academy Awards. All attention is focused on this movie, Gravity. And here's the thing. The fact and the fiction are, on the surface, identical. But why is there such this incredible difference in interest between what is fact and what is fiction? Well, the answer is a simple one. And the answer is because the movie is based on a story. There is a, con a beautiful story that is told. The story starts with two characters and their adventures. But the most important part is that the story follows a very specific and, in fact, a very simple arc. It begins here, and it's a very common arc. It's one we've seen a million times before. The undeniable power of a story because it shows us characters that we can identify with and it follows those characters along a, a nearly predictable story arc. It's what makes us human. It is how we understand the world. Story is what gives life matter. How does this tie into what I want to share with you with show and tell? For the very simple reason that when we go and make a presentation, our a goal is very, very simple. It's to inspire other people to see the same things that we see. So what's the number one way we're going to do that? We're going to tell them a story. We might remember when I first introduced show and tell that the basic idea is this. Every presentation is a pretty simple proposition. There's us and we have our idea something that we want to share and through entertainment and motivation and good communication and storytelling 
we hope to get other people to be inspired by that idea as well. Well, this is exactly what our movie producers and our movie directors have done because they understand the power of story. We know, though, it's difficult to make an extraordinary presentation. It should be simple, but it's not because we do meet these peaks of presentation doom. We have to address the issues of fear, our own and our audiences. We have to address the issues of confusion. Well, what if we've got a complex story we're trying to relate, or our idea is too complicated to fit into a simple story? And then we've got the peak of boredom. How do we make sure that we're entertaining and magic enough to keep people's attention? Well, for today's session, I want to focus on peak number two. How do we bypass confusion and complexity through clarity? The number one way we establish clarity, rule number two of making extraordinary presentations is we tell a story. Lead with the story and understanding will follow. If we lead our audience with a story, their understanding will come right along with us. You don't need to take my word for it. Here are two of the most successful authors. Lee Child, number one selling detective author right now worldwide. Ursula K. Le Guin, once fantastic best-selling uh, science fiction author. Look what they have to say. I have the thing worked out, the trick or the surprise or the pivotal fact. Then I just start somewhere and let the story work itself out. There have been great societies that did not use the wheel. But there have been no societies that did not tell stories. How does this tie back to our presentations? Well, as we all know, there are lots of different kinds of presentations. I think we could break them down into kind of four basic categories. Uh, presentations that change our audience's information, things like a team status meeting or a financial update or a quarterly report or a project review. Not necessarily exciting, just there to provide some new information. Then I think there are presentations that actually change our audience's abilities. We're introducing a new concept through an academic paper. Maybe we're leading a cooking show. Maybe we're offering a class lecture. The intent is to provide someone with new abilities or new knowledge. Then there are presentations we make where our intent is to change our audience's actions. A job interview. We want to get hired. A sales pitch. We want people to buy something. A product launch. We want to get people to go out and, and notice our new, uh, our new product. And then I think at the top of the heap, in a way, We've got presentations that are really intended to change an audience beliefs. Things like a commencement address at a university. Students, you're about to go into the world. Here's some things you need to believe. Any one of the famous TED Talks, you've all got to watch TED Talks. Look at the, the most successful TED Talks. They're all about changing what does someone believe. They're not about delivering facts. Or a sermon in a temple or a church or a synagogue, what have you. When someone gets up and starts to talk about issues of spiritual change, what they're really talking about is our deep set of core beliefs. So all of these are presentations. And here's the question I have. They're all very different. So what makes one successful? A sports cast from a sports network is nothing like a Rachel Ray cooking show. For those of you outside the United States, Rachel Ray is the most popular uh, on-air uh, uh, on cooking prof teacher right now an Apple keynote from uh, you know Steve Jobs rest in peace or one of these TED talks that we talk about they're all so wildly successful as presentations and yet they're all completely different how come they're so successful the answer is because they are all built on a clear storyline all good presentations follow a single clear storyline there is not just one storyline there are several that they could follow but they always choose one and pick with it. And that storyline is not endless. That storyline is not confusing. And that storyline is not random. It is very well thought through in advance and planned. A storyline is the backbone of any good presentation. Why? Because any idea that we want to convey is going to be complex at the beginning. It's like this wild animal that's out there that we're trying to tame. And the way we tame it is we force that complex idea through the channel of a single storyline. And it forces that confusion into something that is tamed long enough for us to make the idea tolerable to our audience. That's why we need a storyline. Of all of those different presentations we talked about before, I think all of them can be made with one of just four basic storylines. Our team status meeting, our financial update, our quarterly report, or our project review, 
The storyline we'll use is called Report. If we're presenting an academic paper or a new idea or a cooking show or teaching someone a class, the storyline will be an explanation. If we're trying to convince someone to hire us, buy something, change their actions, we're going to give them the pitch. And if we want to help someone rethink their own beliefs, perhaps change those beliefs, the storyline will tell them is a drama. Let me show you what the four storylines look like. The report, the storyline that really conveys the facts, looks something like this. We start out, we deliver some facts, it looks kind of like an EEG. It goes like this. It starts here, it ends here, and over that period we go up a little bit. The explanation looks quite different. We start here, we take someone up a series of steps from where they were to an entire new level of ability. The pitch, which recommends a new action or solution, starts here and then presents a problem. And the pitch has to jump us over that problem and take us to a point where there's a new solution. And that solution always requires that we make some change. And then there is the drama, which starts here. Life is fine, everything's good, we're moving along, and then cr catastrophe happens and we dive down and we hit the absolute bottom. We hit death. Nothing could be worse. But there we make some discovery and we find our way to pull ourselves back up. We've actually risen to a level above where we begin. Those are the four storylines. Every presentation that we will ever give is going to map to one of those. Two main things I'd like all of us to notice about these storylines. Although they look different, they all have two things in common. Number one, they all have a beginning and an end. Every one of them starts at a point and moves through time to take us to another point. And the other thing that's important to notice is the end point is always higher than the beginning point. Every one of the storylines moves us up. The report doesn't move us up very much, but if it's a decent report, it should move us up just a little bit. But every one of them moves us up. In other words, an extraordinary presentation begins with two things. Knowing how far along we want to move our audience and how high do we want to move them as well. In the end, there are really only four ways we can move our audience. We can change their information. People come to us knowing some things and we can add some things onto that. We can change their knowledge or their ability. People come to us with a particular question or not knowing how to do something and we say, well, check your check boxes, here's how to do it. We could change people's actions. People come to us and maybe they're not moving. And we say, no, no, let's go ahead and move. Let's do something different. Let's take action. Or we can change people's beliefs. Perhaps people come to us as cat people and we can convince them to become dog people. Those are the only four ways we can really change someone. And those are the only four reasons we should ever give a presentation. If we're not making one of these changes in our audience, we shouldn't make the presentation at all. So here's the key. In order to pick the right storyline, all we need to know is this. After we've finished our presentation, how do we want our audience to be different than when we started? Our audience is going to start here and they're going to end here. How do we want them to be different? And the key is this. The change we want our audience to experience will determine which one of the four storylines we choose. Here's what I mean. If we want to change our audience's information, we build our presentation as a report. If we want to change our audience's ability, we create our presentation as an explanation. If we want to change our audience's actions, we build our presentation as a pitch. If we want to change our audience's beliefs, we build our presentation as a drama. And yes, it really is as simple as that. This to me is the key to an extraordinary presentation. Know in advance how I want my audience to change tells me exactly which presentation storyline I'm going to choose. 
the storyline that we'll create, I think of it as kind of a living, breathing creature that really does move from beginning to end. It has both a spine, a backbone, that drives the presentation forward, and then it has lots of supporting details and anecdotes that provide detail and color. In <laughs> management consulting ease, that which is taught at uh, all of the big consulting companies, this is called horizontal vertical storytelling. The idea is you have a main horizontal storyline. Oh, my astronauts are lost in space. Oh, my astronauts are going to survive or not. I'm not giving you anything away about this particular movie. And along the way, lots of things are going to happen to them. But I have my main storyline, and then I have lots of supporting activities that make it interesting. Horizontal vertical storytelling, a term that I actually do not like at all. I prefer a much livelier name for what we're going to be talking about our storyline. I call it this, our presentation's underlying message architecture. And you know me and my acronyms, so here's another one. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Puma, the presentation's underlying message architecture. And here's our little Puma down here saying, Dan, you have got to be kidding. And I respond to that Puma, and I say, no, I'm actually completely serious, because here is what the Puma really looks like. This is a schematic diagram of what I believe the main Puma line is of any presentation that we will ever give. The head is the main idea. The spine is the main storyline. The legs are our supporting ideas. And the tail is a last hook that we throw in at the end of the story. That's what the puma is. Isn't that a lot more fun than horizontal, vertical storytelling? I mean, give me a break. Any of you that have been, you've all been with me through the blah, blah, blah training. You know, if we want to make an idea stick, we animate it. We come up with the underlying form of the idea. To me, the form of every presentation is this cat. It's this puma. And what we're going to find is we can use the puma model as a way to build any presentation. Here's what we do. We begin with the head. We just say, here's a summary of what my idea is going to be. And then we block out all of the main storyline through a series of steps, the backbone of our puma. And then under each one of those vertebrae, we put some various details. Those become the legs. They're the things that are hanging off that spine. And then we end the whole thing with a little swish of the tail, just to make it extra interesting. Let me give you two quick examples of pumas, just to show how this animal actually works. And, and the first one is just the puma outline of a very classic Hollywood story, Boy Meets Girl. So this is the tale of a typical Hollywood romance. That's the big idea, the head of the story. And let's start with the, the main blocks. There is a boy, he meets a girl, the boy loses the girl, and the boy gets the girl back. Okay, well let's flesh out a little bit more detail. The boy is carefree, the girl is lovely, the boy is smitten. <gasps> the boy loses the girl. How? Well, Mr. Evil arrives. Mr. Evil steals the girl away and the boy is devastated. Ah, but the boy is going to get the girl back. The boy hires an assistant. The assistant traps Mr. Evil. While the assistant's doing that, the boy saves the girl. And what's the little swish of the tail, of course, is the girl runs off with the assistant. But we can also use our puma for something much more day-to-day, -day, much more mundane. Let's say our status update. So the head is, our team has recovered from a particularly bad business year. And here's the main story. The last year was really hard. But last quarter started to look pretty good, and next quarter looks awesome. Well, let's provide some details. What happened? Well, how did it look bad last year? The market tanked. Everyone suffered, and we thought it was over for our business. But last quarter started to look pretty good. The market stabilized. We doubled down on the basics, and sales returned to pre-crash levels. Next quarter looks really great. New markets are opening. We're ahead of the curve, and we're hiring top talent again. So what's the little swish of the tail that we'll add on? Now's the time to launch our new product, the one we've been sitting on in the down market for the last couple of years. So the point I wanted to make is we can use this Puma outline to tell any story. We start with our main object, we map out this, the backbone, we put in the details, we close it with a little swish of the tail. What we're going to find as we go through all of the book Show and Tell is that there are four 
Pumas that map to our four storylines. And I've got to tell you, my associates, this is, I think, my favorite thing that I've ever come up with. I'm just so excited about this. Here's the Puma. The resting Puma is the report. Just kind of lies there. The climbing Puma is the explanation, moving us to a new level of understanding. The pouncing Puma is the pitch, jumping us over a problem. And the leaping Puma is the drama, taking that huge leap of faith across the cliff to change our beliefs. And when we meet next time, we're going to start one by one going through the four Pumas to build what I really think is the critical issue of show and tell. That's my presentation for you this morning. I just wanted to get you aware of and hopefully excited about the general structure of the book and how to make an excellent presentation. And we're going to wrap this up, as we usually do, with a couple of reviews of homework. Last time's homework, I asked you all to create some drawings about your own presenter's journey. And we've got two folks that have volunteered to share their presentations with us. First off will be Veronica. Veronica, can you hear me all right? Oh, yeah. Hi, Veronica. So, Veronica, why don't you just give us a little background and walk us through your presentation, and I'll click as we go. Sure. Um, this is a presentation that I made with one of my longtime customers. He has a, he had a website with me for 10 years, but somebody else originally did the website, and he comes to me every couple of years and just wants me to update the new brochures and such. And I finally just couldn't do it anymore, and I presented to him that we should create a new website, and he thought that was a good idea, but he had a lot of investment in photos on his website of sunsets and the lake and snowboarding and such that were, were, weren't really related to hot tub selling. But he said, I can make a new site as long as I kept all the old pictures on the existing site, which okay. was quite a challenge, and I couldn't overcome that. So I asked to meet with him to talk about that, and this is the presentation that came out of that meeting. All right. So shall I click ahead? Yeah, please do. Okay. So the first thing I was trying to explain to my customer was that in the 10 years since he started his website, the web's really changed. And I walked him through how IE5 came out and Netscape, and we didn't even have search really until 2005, 2006, and then the iPhone was introduced, and Facebook, and then the iPads, and that's really changed. And the point I was really trying to make to him is that when he first started, websites were used for very different purposes. And now there's over 1.5 million sites if you do a search for hot tubs in Tahoe, which is where we are. Oh my God, you're kidding. 1.5 million? Yeah, if you just do a regular Google or Bing search, it comes up and says, that's what those search engines say are about this topic. So I was really trying to explain to him that um, we really have to focus. People aren't looking for your website to be about snowboarding. They really, if they want to see hot tubs, they really want to see just hot tubs. All right, well, let's go on. How did you do that then? Well, we started talking about his customers, and, and I asked him to talk to me a little bit about the customers that he had previously, and I kind of characterized them, perhaps unfairly, and... I think it stung his feelings a little bit, but originally his customers were hippies. You know, this is back in the dial-up age. It's kind of hard to remember that, where um, people had hot tubs, and it was kind of like free-spirited and fun, and people had those kind of wine barrel hot tubs in the backyard. And his customers now are very different. They're into fitness and hydrotherapy and swim spas. They look at websites on their iPhones and their iPad, and their attention spans about seven seconds for landing on a new site. <laughs> And that was a big revelation to him. And what the best thing about this presentation that I was just shocked myself is that by explaining to him about Facebook and stuff, he actually came up with a solution. He said, well, oh, I see. You're going to make me a Facebook page and move all my personal pictures to the Facebook page, and you want to make me a new site. And I was like, well, yes, that's a great idea. Of course, it wasn't what I intended. I just was hoping to get him to change his mind. <laughs> so that was actually success, yes? But he came up with a solution himself, so it, we're moving forward on a new site. I'm very excited. Wonderful. Well, Veronica, any quick lesson you want to share with us from uh, using pictures to help uh, think about your presentation? Um, actually drawing them in front of the customer with the customer to me really helped him come up with solutions. So that was a new thing for me and I was very excited. I think that's, and that is always the case, you know, and that's where I think our lessons are useful is learning to become comfortable drawing in front of someone in a live meeting you know we're 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 all singing from the same choir right now nothing is more powerful than drawing those simple pictures as you sit across the table from your from your client from even your, even from if you're client. embarrassed about your drawings yeah oh the quality of the drawing skills is of absolutely zero relevance when we're actually sitting in front of someone they don't care at all what the drawing looks like they just like to see that there's a drawing veronica wonderful you always do great work thank you keep 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 it up okay 
Thanks, Dan. All right. And next up, uh, John, I know you're here somewhere. Long list today. Okay, John, I think I've turned on the right. John, John, are you with us? Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Associates. Yes. Good morning. Okay, John, you, as always, have come up with a very high concept, beautiful presentation. Uh, why don't you go ahead and walk us through what are we looking at? Well, the concept I came up with was looking at the various civilizations, and I was trying to change people's beliefs about how civilization actually evolves. So that's a very high level concept. So the simple visual equation or the central idea is first came the temple, then the city. Graphic, you'll see I looked at one of the earliest civilizations of Egypt and what's not known by a lot of people is that there's a profound uh, astronomical correspondence between the placements of the three great pyramids and the star sign of Orion. So that graphic was trying to indicate there was, we, we've had some great civilizations and we, our beliefs about them are that we think they were a primitive culture when in fact there's a sophistication there and an understanding of the sciences that um, in many respects we have lost. So if you look at the new, say the, the, the film that you're recommending to us, Gravity, that's looking at a profound, we, you know, our civilization has really advanced through our scientific knowledge. These previous civilizations I think had a corresponding knowledge and we're going to see it comes out in the graphics and images that they use. Fantastic. I didn't realize the correspondence with Orion. Is it, Do they map to Orion's belt? They map to Orion's belt, exactly. Of course, the Egyptians weren't calling the constellation Orion. W do you know the name and what was the uh, creature that it represented? They, they had a similar correspondence even to the, the, the astrological correspondence we use today. So if you look at the Sphinx, it actually corresponds with the sign of Leo rising at a certain time. Then what I, w I just chose one location, Gebekli Tepe in Turkey, and it's the oldest known archaeological site and it has evidence of significant prolonged construction activity by human beings and it's carbon dated to be 11,000 BC and the, one of the significant points is that these structures were, while they were built 12,000 years ago, there was actually continuous activity over 3,000 years and each generation they'd actually cover up part of the temple and they keep building up so what was a flat plain became a, a hill or a tepe and I just wanted to give one example of the sophistication of the structure and they erected these monumental complexes and there were about 200 pillars in 20 circles these blocks weighed up to 20 tons some of them up to 6 meters or 20 feet tall and the central point for those who are scientifically orientated is that this temple was built at a time when civilization was in the hunter-gatherer stage, not in the agricultural or farming stage. Uh, if we look at the actual images at Gebekli Tepe, on the left-hand side what you see is not depicted are hunting raids, wounded animals, or even the type of food they may have eaten, which is game or, or deer. On the right-hand side uh, you see the sort of images that they have were lions, snakes, spiders and scorpions. And so the question that I ask myself is what do we actually see in these images and one of the conclusions that the archaeologists have drawn is that the, the animal and other images give no indication of organized violence. Hmm. And then finally just presenting myself I'm saying that this civilization was representative of advanced visual thinkers and I think these images are a clue to the character of the culture and civilization at that time and the why question that I pose to myself and to the audience is it's, it's a wonder why these particular images were chosen by our ancestors who are not so different to ourselves. Extraordinarily thoughtful. John, as usual, thank you and it gives us more food for thought for thinking about not only how things we might want to research on our own but just again this connection that I often feel myself going all the way back through time with people who used visuals as a way to express what they were thinking. Fantastic. John, as always, thank you again. You're welcome. That brings us to an end for this session of the Napkin Academy, and I have good work for all of you that diligently do your homework, as I'm not going to assign any homework over the next session. If you have work of your own, it could be work that you've done for business or work that you've done for fun or something that you just find particularly visually interesting, go ahead and create a topic, submit your work onto the showcase. Hey, thank you all for another great lesson. This is Dan signing off from the Napkin Academy, but don't go away. Now on our new platform, you can still submit your homework. Debbie, our community manager, is going to join you right now 
to show you exactly how to do that. And I really encourage you, do your homework. Okay, take it away, Debbie. See you soon. We hope you enjoyed this Napkin Academy classic video. We've made it easier than ever to share your homework. After you've completed your homework and have a JPEG or PNG file saved on your computer, come back to this course. Once you're back here, scroll to the bottom of the screen, and in the comments box, you can add a comment. I'm just going to call this one my homework. You can also add images by clicking on the Insert Edit Image button here. In the source box, click on the file. In the images window, click on upload and then click on add files. This is going to take you to your computer where you can search for your images. I'm just going to search for mine in pictures and I'm going to choose this image here. You can also add multiple images here. Click upload. After the upload is complete, click close. Then scroll down and you'll see that the last image is here and it's checked. This is the one we just uploaded. Click insert. I suggest in the dimensions box you change the maximum to 1200 pixels and leave the constrained proportions box checked. You can also add an image description here if you'd like. Click OK. You'll see that your image has been added to your comment. And now the last step, the most important one, make sure that you click the green comment button here to upload your homework to the Napkin Academy. We hope to see your homework soon.